is I wanted beauty like the Dark Frog community had. Yes. Uh, back back then, uh, the standard idea for a chameleon was you took a ficus tree and you put a chameleon on it and you wrapped a screen cage around it. And that was essentially the care. Uh, maybe people put a, a couple of sprigs of plastic plant in there, but uh, hey, you got to see your chameleon all the time, right. uh, but it wasn't happy. Are there any species of chameleon that could be on par with something like a panther as far as their you know, hardiness and relative ease of care that just aren't popular in herpetoculture yet? Or is it kind of, you know, you have your veil and your panther, and then after that, it's mostly a little more challenging? Uh, you're right about the Veiled and Panther being probably the top ones, but there are many others that would just be perfect, uh, that would be right next door, uh, ne alongside the Veiled and the Panthers. The, uh Welcome to episode number 92 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Now, my guest today is a very special one. As you were listening through the intro there, I am speaking with Bill Strand. I think Bill is one of the most known names in herpetoculture, both in North America as well as Europe. He is, of course, the host of the Chameleon Academy podcast, formerly known as the Chameleon Breeder podcast. And that podcast itself has had a massive influence on not only the chameleon side of the hobby, but also just reptile keeping in general. I know plenty of people, including myself, that don't own chameleons but listen to his podcast because so much of the information that you can get from it can be translated into other species. Now, in the episode, we discuss Bill's history, how he got into chameleon keeping, which is actually a pretty interesting and relatively funny story. So he tells us about that. And then we discuss how he took the turn into the business venture side of chameleon keeping or reptile keeping with his company Dragon Strand Caging, as well as starting the Chameleon Breeder podcast, which eventually became the Chameleon Academy. It's hard to think of another person within herpetoculture who has done more for a species than what Bill Strand has done with chameleons. He has really spearheaded that movement of improving care and providing gold standard care for new keepers and really helping people along. And again, obviously something we talk about on the podcast a lot is promotion of naturalistic keeping. And that's really what Bill has done with the Chameleon Academy. So we talk about that in the podcast. And we also talk about the new venture that he's moving in towards, which is breeding in those naturalistic complex setups. So this episode really partners well with the episode number 86 that I recorded with TC Houston, where we talk about small batch breeding, as well as episode number 88, I believe, with Chelsea is Daner, where we talk about breeding in complex setups. The episode numbers might be wrong, but the guests are obviously right. So you can go back and listen to those if you haven't. And Bill listened to both those episodes and he was really excited by them. And that's sort of what sparked this conversation. So we talk about how his plan is to incorporate that into the chameleon world. So I really do hope you enjoy the episode. I had a blast chatting with Bill. Before we jump into things, a couple quick housekeeping things. As always, if you're enjoying the show and you want to find more information on it, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you can find the show notes for each episode and all the links and things that were discussed in each episode are found there. If you are interested in picking up an Animals at Home t-shirt or sweater, you can head to animalsathome.ca slash shop and there you can find the sweaters and t-shirts there. $5 is automatically donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. Thank you very much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring the episode of the podcast. If you're looking for new reptile equipment, make sure you check out the affiliate links in the YouTube description as well as the show notes. Of course, if you do make a purchase, a small commission does come back to me, which helps support the show. And if you would like early access to the episodes as well as the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests and really have a more interactive experience with the podcast, you can join us over at patreon.com slash animals at home. And there you can get some behind the scenes info depending on what tier you sign up for. Let's jump into the episode. Enjoy. Bill, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. Hello, Dylan. It's very good to be here. I think you are an industry staple at this point, a herpetoculture staple. You're one of those names that always pops up. You provide just an unbelievable amount of good information for the hobby in general. And I cannot wait to get into the podcast and the other projects you're on. But let's get a little bit of Bill Strand background here because, you know, you're, you're this ever-present chameleon expert. Where did this begin? <laughs> oh, it began very young. 
Uh, we're talking grade school in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, back in the previous century. And, uh, and I had loved animals so much and, it, and got into reptiles, but I never found that one creature that just spoke to me. Uh, ever since dinosaurs, uh, nothing could take their place until I met the chameleon. And uh, it was just love at first sight. Uh, and, and it just went from there. I, I uh, throughout my life stages, whether it be researching in a library or, uh, or going to the zoo or pet stores all around, I've never been uh, away from chameleons. Were they the first reptile you kept at home? Oh, no. I went through so many others. I went through uh, snakes, uh, iguanas, anoles, geckos, uh, tortoises, uh, you name it. I had a, a virtual zoo coming through my house. And uh, that's actually why my parents said, no, you can't have a chameleon. We're sick of all of these things coming through the house. And uh, it was very heartbreaking for me because I knew I had met my life passion. Uh, but to be fair to my parents, uh, everything was my life passion at that point. So how would they know? <laughs> you left the chameleon too late in the buying line. <laughs> uh, it, uh, apparently, I, it, it was pretty sad because I didn't know that they existed before that. So, you know, it was all about discovery back then. So then tell me about the first chameleon you brought home. Uh, that, that was also my first political campaign. Um, <laughs> so I had this problem that my parents had said no to a chameleon. How do you get around that when you're in the, uh, I believe, seventh grade? Yes. Uh, and so what I did is I uh, convinced my entire class that they needed to have a class pet. Uh, and I don't know how I pulled this off, but I got every one of them to donate a dollar. And we got a chameleon as a class pet. Now, in my, my young mind, I, I was, uh, my mind was working overtime, and I realized everybody's going to get sick of this pet and it's got to go home with somebody during the summer. Right. And, uh, it, it, everything worked perfectly according to plan. And I remember my mother saying, we said no chameleon. Why is there a chameleon in the living room? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I had successfully gotten one in, uh, and, uh, that, that was the start of my first chameleon, which, uh, had babies and uh, it was a female Jackson's chameleon. And so, uh, I guess it was a first my first breeding experience as well. So it started early. That's a pretty complicated class pet too, a Jackson's chameleon. Oh yes, yes. Um, you guys went and, all in. Well, it was mostly me, and <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to, to be honest, I, I convinced everybody it would be a very cool thing, and everybody agreed with me for the first uh, first uh, week or two. And after that, they lost interest, but I got to school every morning and uh, I took it out and I fed it, make sure it got its uh, food and took care of it, water, everything. So uh, they didn't have to work hard for it. I went ahead and did all the hard work. That is an amazing origin story for the chameleon. I think that, <laughs> that, that you can tell how much passion you have for them starting the, the first political oh, yeah. career move. So <laughs> at, at that point, as you brought your first one home, then your collection may have must have started to shift away from the other species towards chameleon. Is that what kind of happened over time? You started to, I guess you were still at home at the time. Yes, I was still at home at the time, and I was under the, dr the draconian rules of my parents. Mm -hmm. And so expansion was not that easy. And to be honest... I didn't even know there was any other chameleons uh, out there. I didn't, I, as far as I knew, the Jackson's chameleon was the only one that existed. And we had these animal cards that would come in the mail. And uh, through researching these animal cards, I re realized there was at least two other species out there. And so uh, th this was a, <laughs> a real, uh, the internet age is not going to really uh, appreciate uh, how hard it was to get information Yes. way back then, uh, especially when you were a kid who couldn't drive. <laughs> and, uh, and I would go from a public library to public library, and I would uh, transcribe the uh, chameleon's uh, part of the encyclopedia. I'd look up chameleon, and I would transcribe whatever it said, and then I'd con my parents into taking me to another library because you can't deny your kid library visits. Exactly. And, uh, and I would uh, write down, find another encyclopedia and write down that, all the information out of that encyclopedia. And so that, that was my, my notebook of information. Um, well, I was and, just thinking about this the other day, because even myself, the internet was pretty 
in its infancy when I was 11 or 12, mm-hmm. it still wasn't something that you would just go access and see things. So, you know, you, when someone would tell you something that they saw or something on, on the, across the world that was amazing, all you were left with was the image that they painted with their words. And you just had to assume, you had to, you know, use your imagination. I guess that's what it would have been like for you. You're reading the encyclopedia, reading about these species. Maybe there was a black and white photo or maybe even a colored oh. photo if you're lucky. But for the most part, yeah. it's just yeah. totally what you create in your mind. Yeah. It, and there were pet stores. And mm-hmm. so I could go there and they would uh, it, it, uh, share information with me. But uh, like I said, when I was young, it was uh, as a well, seventh grader, it was kind of difficult to uh, do a, a research project uh, yeah. completely new, but I, I did the best I could and it was a lot of fun. So then what, what's the progression after that at you, as you become an adult and you start collecting more, getting more chameleons? And then did you get into breeding or, or how does that story work? Well, um, it was off and on as I went through high school and college and uh, as much as I could here or there. Uh, It really blossomed when I uh, got an apartment of my own and I immediately set up, I took the table out of the dining room because that's useless. And I created a, a little rainforest area right there. Instead of the dining room, I lined it with a, a plastic and, and made little walls on it. And I put trees in there, lights. I put a complete misting system in there. And uh, so, yeah, I'm lucky that the apartment uh, manager never came <laughs> yeah. by and checked because uh, that probably wasn't what he was expecting uh, or would have approved. And, uh, and I had my, my rainforest, all my chameleons uh, on there. And... Uh, um, uh, People who are listening now and have listened to my podcast would realize that I have broken just about every rule that I have laid down for chameleon (laughs) keeping. Uh, But I want to let you all know that I know that those are rules because I messed up and I went through all of it in the beginning. And so I, uh, it was from personal experience. Uh, Don't do what I did. Yeah. You learn the hard way. (laughs) But, but, I'll say when I actually left the apartment, uh, I had done that that tarp and that area so well that the dining room was pristine when uh, I left that apartment. It was uh, pretty impressive. No leaks. So these were just were they just free roaming in this area? You had a couple chameleons. They in were. That space? Okay. I had a free range. Yeah. Hey, it worked out. But like you said, we know now there's better ways to do it. So oh as, my goodness. As of right now, how big is your collection? How how many animals do you have? I have not counted lately. Um, it's uh, I, I. I'm gonna. I, I really don't know. Uh, possibly fifty. Okay. I think. Uh, and the problem is, uh, I work with a lot of live bearing species, mm-hmm. and so every now and then my population spikes, and comes down, and uh, I have to do uh, new counts if I want to figure out how many I have. But uh, so a lot of those are babies, juveniles that I'm raising up. Um, but uh, I have a lot of cages, and I, I'm lucky to have uh, live in Southern California, and so outdoor keeping is a, a, a possibility for me, and that makes it so easy. I, I do a lot with uh, uh, planter box cages, and so you have these cages that are on planter boxes. They're they're densely planted. And honestly, chameleons just take care of themselves. If you give them the environment that they need, it's simple to take care of them because they do it. Mm. And the sun really simplifies things. Oh, natural sunlight is magic. I I, I can't tell. If you take a chameleon that's uh, having problems indoors, you put them outdoors and the breezes and the natural sun and uh, the, the humidity cycles. And it's amazing what it does for them. And which is a testament to why uh, learning about nature is so important for those of us who want to keep chameleons inside. Well, and they, they are relatively sensitive species. And, and so how do you feel about their place in herpetoculture? Because I think sometimes, I wouldn't say anybody paints them as a beginner species, but you can walk into any random chain pet mm-hmm. store and find one there and people go home as like an impulse purchase or a first time keeper. So where do you think they should sit? Because they are harder to, to keep. They are harder to keep, but I think it's because uh, they're more expensive to set up. 
and it takes skill to set them up. The information to do that is out there. So uh, in the chameleon community, we have a vast network of very good panther chameleon breeders. Uh, that species has the, uh, uh, it is hardy and it is colorful and it has a high enough price point that people can uh, make money breeding them. And so what we have is an established group of breeders long term that are there to help you and uh, handhold you. So if you're a beginner, you've never had a reptile before, and you meet up with one of these uh, panther chameleon breeders, you can have a chameleon as a first pet, no problem, because they're going to set you up correctly. If you go into a big chain pet store, uh, they have all this plastic stuff and a, and a kit, which is horrible you are going to have a very short experience with that chameleon. And it's not because necessarily they're hard and it's not because you made a mistake. It's just, you weren't given the right information to begin with. Uh, so say we do a hypothetical, say we were able to give all the information there at the point of sale at these uh, big chain pet stores, would a chameleon then be a good beginner pet? Um, I, I would then say I, I'd still be hesitant mm -hmm. because uh, chameleons, we chameleon keepers end up wrapping our lives around the chameleon and uh, they're, they're a little bit more care than other reptiles. And so it's, I, I like to say, I, I try to discourage people from getting a chameleon, but if only a chameleon would do, welcome you with open arms. If you are ready to do what it takes to uh, take care of a chameleon, you're going to be successful. They're really not that hard if you've made that decision to mm -hmm. give them what they need. If you are, are coming into it and saying, yeah, I just want something nice sitting in a cage and I don't want to spend a whole lot of money on the mister and all these lights and stuff, yeah, it's going to fail. Well, and I guess that's why there's such a good hobbyist animal for somebody that wants to sink their teeth into a really a good project because like you said it's not crazy complicated but you still get no. to tinker with the cage tinker yep. with the mister and the fogger and and that's one of my favorite parts about keeping mm -hmm. reptiles is you get to do that and play around with things and as long as you're within that window of survivability and so they can thrive you get to play that tinker and and mess yeah. around with with how you're keeping yeah, and chameleons are wonderful as first reptiles, uh, because they have, uh, they're more communicative. I mean, yeah, you okay, veils can be a little bit grumpy at times, but they literally wear their emotions on their sleeves. You can, you see what they're thinking. And so it's a, it's a reptile that has a, uh, a communication that we can, uh, take part in. One of the problems is we don't speak chameleon very well to start off with, and we have to learn what all those color changes and postures mean, but they're there for us to interact with. And so uh, we can uh, really communicate with that chameleon. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I never thought about that before because that's one of the issues with reptiles is they can be so stoic and you have no idea if they're thriving or if they're completely suffering, but chameleons do have a little bit of a window into how they're feeling. Are there any species of chameleon that could be on par with something like a panther as far as their, you know, hardiness and relative ease of care that just aren't popular in herpetoculture yet? Or is it kind of, you know, you have your veil and your panther and then after that it's mostly a little more challenging? Uh, you're right about the veiled and panther being probably the top ones, but there are many others that would just be perfect uh, that would be right next door, uh, ne alongside the Veiled and the Panthers, the uh, Bradypodian uh, dwarf chameleons from South Africa. Uh, th those are incredibly hardy and they come from uh, about the distance away from the equator as the United States is from the equator, just the opposite direction. And so they're used to these uh, wide temperature swings. And, uh, and so that's a perfect chameleon as, as a beginner chameleon. Uh, we can't get them out of South Africa, so that's why you don't see them much. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other, I mean, like the male Fursifer minor, and I'll start doing a little bit of uh, Latin thrown around here. But there are other species there that are hardy. And once you get down keeping a chameleon, it's amazing uh, what what opens up to you as far as possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the Jackson's chameleon, which is uh, the third most popular, is a little bit more challenging because it needs 
cold nighttime drops. And so that becomes a problem for people to recreate. Uh, so even though that's the third most popular, it probably shouldn't be up in the top three. Yeah, it's one of the funny things about the reptile hobby in general is, you know, we'll have certain animals that become the one, two, three popular and it's just sort of there by happenstance rather than there for a good reason. And so that's probably what happens in chameleons as well. Well, it's 100% availability. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, the ones that are easy. Jackson, Jackson's chameleon came from Hawaii. And so they were just brought over in mass. And so even though they weren't ideal as a pet, so many people started off with Jackson's chameleons. Uh, I hand up. You as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, though mine came from uh, the leaky sending them over from Kenya. So there was a uh, Jackson's migration then. And then there was one later on with Hawaii. But uh, uh, it, yeah, that it was because it populated Hawaii that it became popular here. So it had nothing to do with its pet potential. Right. Exactly. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about your movement into more of the professional space. You have Dragon Strand as well as the podcast. So how did these things pop up? I, I've been passionate about uh, chame uh, community outreach. Uh, back in the early 2000s, I started the first uh, uh, chameleon easing, the digital magazine, the chameleonnews.com, uh, with a, a couple of other chameleon enthusiasts. And so I, I've had this passion for educating the community. And one of the uh, biggest things that I was working on was uh, individual raising of baby chameleons. And uh, boy, we can definitely get into challenges of breeding chameleons, but one of the biggest is chameleon babies don't like to be around each other. And so uh, I've been working with individually raising baby chameleons and it, it just works so much better, but there really wasn't a, a good product out there to do that. And so I designed a, uh, a, a baby nursery cage system and just, I found somebody who's willing to make it for me. Uh, so I said, what the heck? I'm going to, uh, under the uh, excuse of making a business out of it, I'm going to make a bunch of cages for me. Yeah. And uh, so I made a bunch of cages for me and I just threw them up there and there and there and said, does anybody else want to join me in this? I mean, they're much more expensive. They're handmade here in the United States. They're hybrid cages instead of screen cages, which of course sent the community for a loop. But uh, these, these were great. And uh, if you guys want some, here they are. And, and as, as far as when you say hybrid, for those that are that aren't maybe not aware, those uh, yes. you have you know plastic panels on some of the sides, right? Yes, uh, in the chameleon community, uh, the general community is I don't know, do I say obsessed with screen cages? Yeah, uh, they are. And this is because, and, and there's actually a reason for it. It's because back when we were trying to keep chameleons alive, uh, we we had them in glass cages and. They would die because put a chameleon in an aquarium, it's going to die. Uh, and, and, but there are so many other things there. We didn't have uh, uh, parasite medicines. We were trying to figure out UVB and all this. So there was so much going on. Uh, but then we started using screen cages and chameleons started living, which was great. Um, now, much of this... Uh, revolution happened in Southern California, which had a large chameleon keeping population and screen cages in Southern California are a very good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't necessarily great for people in Ohio, uh, but uh, everybody, uh, we got this message out. The biggest voices were in Southern California. And so chameleons and screen cages became synonymous. And if you don't have a screen cage, you have a respiratory infection, chameleon dies, don't do this. Well, chameleons need ventilation. Uh, they just don't need 100% ventilation. And so uh, by uh, enclosing the sides of your cage, you can, uh, you can uh, maintain humidity and chameleons need humidity. Uh, and all you need is enough ventilation so that your surfaces dry out during the day so you don't have a constantly wet cage. Uh, so the hybrid cages, and, and actually throughout all that time, I was using, secretly using hybrid cages. And uh, I finally decided to productize them under the Dragon Strand name. And it was actually, I, I've added on screen cages to my uh, repertoire, but that was actually later on. Dragon Strand was about individual baby cages and the hybrid cages. Mm. So solid sides. 
Yeah, it's it's funny with the whole humidity thing. I, I remember years ago seeing someone comment on Facebook, I think, and they said, if you need to mist your enclosures, whatever, it's just a general animal. If you need to mist your animals or your reptiles enclosure, that means you haven't set up the enclosure right because you're losing too much humidity. And I think, you know, if you live in Florida, that could be true. But I live in the winter, it gets to 7% humidity in my apartment. Mm, <laughs> you know, yeah. I have to mist. It's just part of it. Yeah. And, and then I think, you know, ventilation is another huge thing. We want to make sure... It, it, it's almost opposite where the chameleon world, we have way too much ventilation in a lot of cases. And then with other animals, we're just sealing everything up to hold in that like, you know, damp <laughs> air. So we, we got to learn to balance it. Yeah. And w- one thing you mentioned is like what I mentioned is you get loud voices that have a personal experience mm-hmm. and make the, uh, dare I say, a mistake of not of presenting it as though their reality is everybody's reality and not taking into account that every every place has different environments from cold and hot to moist and moist and cold I'm sorry say cold and hot <laughs> dry <laughs> dry and hot to cold and moist to dry and cold and there's all these different uh, variations of environments that people are trying to keep this chameleon or reptile in. And for those of us who want to be uh, speaking and helping people, we need to use our personal experiences, but also step above that and say, okay, how does this relate to that person's experience? Mm-hmm. And we need to put our uh, be able to see it from their eyes and help them with their situation, not just push our narrative of our reality. Exactly. Yeah. That's where you want the keepers to be able to problem solve on their own. Like, okay, this is what we're saying as a general rule, but if there's something that is different on your end, this is how you would change it. So what year did you start Dragon Strand? What year did that start happening? 2013. Oh, okay. I remember first hearing about it on, I think it was like the Herp Nation podcasts. Uh, okay, were you yeah. a sponsor there? I, I think you may have been. Uh, yeah, I was part of the Herp Nation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I really loved that the, all those podcasts and it was kind of one of the, the motivations of starting this one. And, and so that's when I first heard of it. And so then you started your own podcast, Chameleon Breeder yes. Podcast originally. So tell me a yeah. little bit about that. Uh, I loved podcasts and uh, I somewhere I said, I wish somebody would make a chameleon podcast. <laughs> and I looked in the mirror and found out I was somebody. Yeah. So uh, I decided I was going to do a, a chameleon podcast. Uh, although it actually took me about two years to really to release the first episode. It was a, a bit of a, a trial and error of getting it going. At first, it was going to be the Dragon Strand podcast. And I, I had a nice intro for it. and But it just didn't I actually didn't want it to be uh, connected to the K. I wanted it to be a, a separate entity. And then I, I had to get used to uh, making a podcast. And I, I remember trying out different episodes, different voices, different approaches. And my wife would be yelling from the other room, ah, you're putting me to sleep. <laughs> okay, so no, so no, Wolf Band Jack coming here and telling you about chameleons. None of that. Okay, and then, uh, and then I would go, "Hey, I'm here talking about chameleons." And she said, "Too much energy," and so it took a while to find <laughs> what's my what's my true voice here to uh, make it uh, authentic. So, when you first started it, was the intention to have guests on, or were you thinking it would just be solo for a while, or? I, I did uh, intend to have guests on. It, it was really meant to be a, uh, my mission was to bring the chameleon community uh, together. I don't know if anything can bring any community together. Uh, I mean, but I wanted to highlight the people that were doing good things in the community. Uh, it's, I realized that, uh, especially in this digital world, the ones most qualified and most experienced tend to fade to the background. They don't want to get on Facebook and spend every day fighting and justifying uh, what they're saying. They just want to work with their animals. Mm -hmm. And so I saw this podcast as a way that I could 
bring these people out of the shadows and we could record their experiences for everybody to share and benefit from. And they didn't have to go on social media. They didn't have to waste their time talking to people who are convinced of, that chameleons will die if you put them in glass cages. Uh, and so uh, it, my intention was definitely to scour the world for as much information as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny. I always tell the story on my podcast is I, I called this channel or this podcast Animals at Home because I was really worried that if I just called it reptiles related, I was going to run <laughs> out of content, which which really wasn't was not a problem at all. It's, you know, two years later, I have a list of things. And then you took it like two steps further. You went chameleons yeah. and then you labeled it chameleon breeder. So it's almost like you niched it down very far. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that was really meant to be uh, that I am a chameleon breeder. Right. I am talking. And and I realized later on people were saying, Yeah, this is a great podcast, even if you don't want to breed chameleons. <laughs> yeah. I realized my mistake in the naming of that. Right. And then that's where the Chameleon Academy, obviously, with the name switch came in. Yes. Uh it was uh later on I wanted to consolidate it. I I realized that the biggest problem with my podcast was there was so much content that people didn't know where to find everything. And so I had to come up with some way of indexing it. And then that would have been a huge website to really do that effectively. And then I say, uh, but it'd make it easier if I wrote down all of the information and then had the podcasts as uh, things that they could reference from the web page, and so uh, that that really uh, was a bit of a chameleon academy feel to it, and and it it didn't just come up there. I had that chameleonacademy.com URL saved for about five years at that point because I wanted to do a chameleon academy type uh, website sometime in the future, and it just became time to do it. Well. All of the work that you've done with that, it's probably, the, I would say it is the best amount or the the highest quality care information, husbandry information for any group of animals that we have in herpetoculture by a mile. You know, people, I know, including myself, tons of people listen to your podcast who don't have chameleons because the, the information is so versatile. Like one of my favorite episodes you did, and I reference it all the time, is the one you did with Mario Youngman, I think his name was, with uh -huh. misting and yeah. fogging. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, I tell everybody to listen to that episode because it is so important to just understand the humidity cycles in nature. And it doesn't matter if it's you're keeping a Madagascar species or, or anything else, the concepts carry over. And I think that's what the podcast has done so well. You have these you know, almost like systems where people can listen to an episode and they can pull stuff out very easily. Yeah, and the uh, all the work I've been doing with UVB and supplementation, uh, that is universally uh, applicable. Mm -hmm. And and really, uh, the reason why it's not hard to uh, come up with more uh, uh, more topics and more uh, episodes, even though I, I've got over two hundred uh, now and I'm still going, it's because it's a a record of my personal journey of what I want to know and how I want to grow. So it's not me just telling people what I know. It's me taking people along with me as I grow. And there's so much further that I want to go so much more that I want to learn and, and work out. And so I'm just taking people along with me. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think that's the feel that, that we get from it. So I want to touch on one more thing on this area, because now I've started to hear you use the word multimedia multimedia, I forget uh -huh. what, what's the term you use, but, and then you've also kind of mixed yeah. in the YouTube channel and you just put, put out a, an amazing Panther chameleon care guide. Uh -huh. Even if you don't have a Panther chameleon, go watch it. Cause it's, it, you did such a good job. Are we going to start seeing more of that? Yes. Uh, that is my vision for the chameleon Academy website is that you can go there and you have uh, the ability to read, listen, and watch a video, uh, these different learning styles. And, and even for the same person, there's uh, different ways that you want to uh, absorb the information. And, uh, and I, don't, uh, I don't copy. So those are three separate productions. Yeah, They're I noticed using that. the same material. Yeah. But uh, you can read, 
and then listen and then watch the video. And you're going to get three different experiences that will give you uh, different perspectives on the entire uh, body of knowledge. And, uh, and that excites me because it, it, it makes it a rich learning experience. Uh, and I, that's really been my vision. And so uh, my intention is to continue doing that. Uh, it is an enormous amount of work to pull that off. Uh, so I'm going to do as much as I can. Yeah. Well, yeah, especially when you do, you record the podcast and then you do the video and it's different recording. I mean, that, that was, I immediately yeah. checked when I was watching it. I was like, I wonder if this is the same audio clip that he's used for the podcast. And no, it's not. It's totally different, yep. even though it's the same info. So mm -hmm. what, why did you decide to do that? Because I wanted it to be a companion video okay. and not just a carbon uh, copy, a rehash, uh, because uh, it's, and it also gives me the ability to say it in a different way. Uh, a lot of times I'll use the same words, but just coming at it differently adds a different, a, a, a different flavor to it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these concepts are difficult. I mean, we're talking about UVB and supplementation. Uh, those, those aren't easy. It's taken me years working on it, not just to understand it, but to figure out how to communicate the yes. concepts. Uh, it, it's truly been a personal growth journey just to learn it enough that I can present it. And, and it's amazing what you learn when you try to present it because uh, like UVB, I did all my, uh, my measurements and then I was working off of all those, uh, those readings. And if I just did one set of measurements, life would be great. You know, when you, when you have one set of data, yes, mm, one you, clock, yeah, you know, everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then I, did it again and I got totally different numbers. And so that added a different dimension of why are these numbers different now? Mm. And so that's where I had to explore uh, different bulb fixtures, uh, age of the bulb. Uh, and so uh, all of these different parameters started growing and my, okay, I'm going to do a bunch of measurements and do a podcast episode turned into a literally a two year journey of figuring out how do I explain what I'm seeing and then how do I explain what somebody else is going to see when they take their solar meter and put it on their lamp and they get something totally different. Mm -hmm. I have to explain this so well that they understand why they're getting different readings. And so it it just becomes a an enormous research project and uh, it, it's one of the more fulfilling things about what I'm doing is when I finally get to the point where I can say, I think I can explain this. Yeah. And it's an enormous uh, accomplishment to be able to do that. Well, and there's this sense of just like, it's in a neat package that I would feel so confident sending that to anybody who's getting a chameleon like that. You know, it, it's not, okay, random care guide, random kid just got a veiled chameleon is going to whip through something. You know, there's a ton of substance behind it, but it's just packaged in a way where you just hit every bullet point. And I, like you said, it just yeah. takes practice to, to be able to present it that cleanly. Yeah. And actually that care sheet, that the care summary that I worked off for that video, that's about in its fourth revision, because whenever you put I put out a, uh, a care summary. Uh, then I spend the year getting feedback. And as painful as Facebook can be, uh, it is a uh, it is a, a great laboratory for yes. how people are going to read it and the feedback and what they're going to do and all the unexpected things that they will do with your information that is not what you intended. And then you realize, wow, they took this literally. And so what do I do? Uh, my, my basking temperature, uh, no, the length of uh, the time that you put the basking light on. Uh, I wanted to communicate that you don't have to keep the basking light on all day. So I said, okay, leave it on for two hours. That should be enough. Well, in a colder environment, their chameleon needed it more. And so they, they shut it off at two hours. And they said, Bill, my chameleon needs it more. What do I do? Uh, <laughs> Well, <laughs> turn it back on. Uh, you read the website, and I explain all of this. But if you've got these nice little graphics, 
people don't go and read the website. They say, okay, the graphic is nice and uh, understandable. So what I did is I said, all right, fine. I'm not going to uh, fall into this trap again. I'm going to go ahead and make that basking light uh, line 12 hours. We'll take care of this. No problem. Of course, you know, the uh, phone call I got next. Yeah. Well, my chameleon is overheating. What do I do? <laughs> Turn off the basking light. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> yeah. idea. And I realized, oh, okay, so now they think that because I have it on for 12 hours, they have to have it on for 12 hours. So these are all the things that if, if anybody out there, if you're putting together a care sheet, these are the things that you're responsible for is how people are going to read it. Not just that you have good information, but how it's going to be interpreted. And, and so you'll see now I have, um, even though it uh, my basking uh, bar goes 12 hours, it's got a gradient. So it yeah. fades off. Because <laughs> yeah. I saw that and I was like, I wonder if that was intentional, the way he changed the color. And then, yeah, then you explain. I'm like, okay, that's why he did that. And yeah, it's and plus it's hard to remember what it's like to have zero reptile knowledge. Yeah. And that's where people will be, will be coming at it, right? Like with not knowing a single thing about UV or basking temperatures or anything. So they, they just want, yeah. they need that recipe to get them started. And they're going to have to follow it to the T to feel confident to, to be able to tinker with it later. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely a growth experience in how to present information. Uh, yeah. And, and Right now, I'm, I've got the challenge of how do we present the information of veiled chameleons? Uh, we are keeping them too warm and we're feeding them too much. But if you don't give them enough heat and if you don't give them enough food, the growth will be stunted. And so where's that, where's that point? And how do you communicate that point to somebody who is just new to chameleons? And so that, that's the latest challenge. And as of this point, I don't have answers for you just yet. I'm still working on it. Well, I'm sure within a year or so we'll have we'll have those answers because it's yeah it is amazing how much you're able to put out and so let's change gears a little bit into the sort of the natural keeping this part one of the topics that we wanted to to discuss yeah. today so part of I think one of the pillars of your show is promoting naturalistic care you know providing enrichment for the animals was there any issues in the chameleon community with people not doing that like was there sort of an industrialized style care. Yes. And one thing that I wanted for my community is I wanted beauty like the dart frog community had Yes, uh, back, back then. Uh, the standard idea for a chameleon was you took a ficus tree and you put a chameleon on it and you wrapped a screen cage around it. And that was essentially the care. Uh, maybe people put a, a couple of sprigs of plastic plant in there, but, uh, Hey, you got to see your chameleon all the time, right. uh, but it wasn't happy. And so uh, I had a vision that I wanted my community. I, and, and you'll find, I take the chameleon community pretty personally, and I don't know why, but I, it's my community. I want to keep it strong. And uh, I wanted to uh, present to them a different way of doing it. And to where we could have lush uh, places for our chameleon, beautiful chameleon cages, and give this chameleon the ability to bask and hide. Uh, and that's actually that actually tied in with the uh, the Dragon Strand Chameleon Caging Company, because I invented the Dragon Ledges, which are these anchors that you could put on screen cages. And they allow you to mount horizontal branches and potted plants. And you just hang potted plants up on the screen edge, uh, the screen side. And that becomes kind of a floating garden type uh, approach. And I, I realized one of the problems with us actually doing this is there's no easy way to do it. How do we get things to stick on screen cage walls? Uh, mm -hmm. The screen wasn't meant to do that. And you got to have some sort of bracket or something. And so uh, I actually invented something to allow that progression to happen. And, uh, and so once that was there, then I just uh, continually uh, put, pushed out all of these uh, photos, videos of this floating garden style which gave the chameleons an open area and a place to hide. And so uh, that was a major push of mine. 
And I'm, um, that was in like 2013, 2014 that I really started that. And, and I got to say, I am so happy with how that has turned out. Uh, and then, so now you go on social media and the standard is this lush, well-planted cage. And I think the, the most fulfilling part about it is, is people that, uh, I don't, people that never listened to me, uh, are, are, are saying the words that I was pushing. Mm -hmm. It's because they heard it from somebody else. And then now it's become the industry community standard. Uh, and, and that's not that I need credit for that or anything. It's just a beautiful thing and a demonstration of how we can, if we present things and we make it uh, obtainable by people and we show people how to do it, that they'll take it, they'll run with it, they'll make it their own, and they'll share it with other people in the community to the point where it becomes a community standard. And and just the chameleon care has increased uh, in quality dramatically uh, over these last years. and And now... Yeah, the, the the lushly planted chameleon cage is a standard that everybody says this is what you need. Well, and the amazing thing about improving care standards and husbandry is that it it doesn't take once somebody starts doing it, it's reinforcing because they see why it's necessary. They enjoy keeping that way, and then they they want to talk about it. They want to show others what their enclosures look like. So it sort of has it takes on a life of its own, right? It sort of grows yeah. on its own. There's no, it's not like people have to do this and it's work and it's annoying and there's no good feeling that they get from it. So I feel like once you get the ball rolling, then it, it goes quickly. And I think it just shows how much, you know, you, you say it's not all related to you, but I think a lot of it is related to you, how much you've been pushing this message. And it's amazing how much one person can shift an entire section of the hobby towards the better. That's just incredible. Yeah. And, you know, another exciting part about it is we're going into the second stage. And this is uh, people have embraced the idea that we're not just creating a cage around a chameleon, we're creating an environment that our chameleon is thriving in. We, we've got to take care of the environment that we've created. And so uh, I, I, I will take credit for starting that message, but there is so much of the community that has embraced it and they're taking it the next step. Uh, there is more bioactive cages going on now. It's becoming more of a, a standard of people to ask for and, and want to get involved in. And so people are getting into that mindset of taking care of uh, this environment. And, and I love the fact that people are taking the baton and they're going on. And, and I'm letting them. I, my, I feel my place is in the freshman class. And so I'm staying where it's simple. You'll notice my cage design of this, uh, this floating garden style, it has not changed since I started in what, 2015, 2014. Uh, I, I had this formula that I've made as simple as possible. Dragon ledges, two vertical branches per dragon ledge. And then you uh, hang your pots and your branches off of those uh, vertical branches. And, and I've got it down to a recipe and I do it over and over and over again. Every single cage that I make that I show is a variation on that recipe. And that's that's not because I don't want to do anything else. It's because by doing that repetition that everybody sees it and it makes it really easy to follow, the people coming into the chameleon community can make a beautiful chameleon cage very easily because everybody knows how to do it. And and, and once you've got that basic, go, do wonderful things, do bioactive, do uh, make these incredible cages, please go do that. Um, and I'm just excited that there are people taking that baton and creating these beautiful enclosures. And, and I'm happy to stay where I am right now. Right now, my I still have work to do at yeah. the entry level. And, and well, that's where I'm, I'm going to be. It, it, and it's like you're saying, it's that importance of the keepers having early success. And if they have that blueprint that gives them the proper lighting, proper heating, proper enrichment that they can do relatively simply, they're going to have success with the animal. And obviously the bonus is the animal doesn't suffer and die, which is what we're yeah. really trying to prevent. So yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I know that when we were speaking through email, sort of your next phase, you were talking about moving this over to the breeding side. Yeah. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Was is breeding in the chameleon world fairly 
industrial right now as well or or what's the situation there yes it is i would say industrial uh, there's more and more of a shift towards uh, making it more naturalistic. What I would like to do is make that, uh, is normalize that. I guess that's why I'd say is normalize that and say, this is what it should look like. This is what you should expect it to look like. Um, the, the breeders that have built our community to where it is now have been invaluable. We could not get here without them. And that required figuring out how to breed chameleons, uh, a lot of chameleons in a small space and, uh, and lots of chameleons in a small space is not easy because mm -hmm. chameleons don't get along. They're not communal. You can get away with keeping babies together up until the three month point. But even at that point, you're going to start getting nip tails and uh, uh, chameleons are going to start uh, beating up on each other. So there's a lot of compromises that need to be in place to be able to have bins and bins and bins of babies. Uh, we have figured that out. We as a community have figured that out, how to do mass breeding of say panther chameleons, veiled chameleons. And, um, and as I just love that interview that you had with TC mm -hmm. uh, and where he talked about the critical mass of, we need to have a big enough community that it can support exotic vets, vets that are experienced in reptiles. And once we get to a community of a size that uh, we have that influence, veterinary offices are going to go to the vet school and say, hey, I need somebody who's interested in these reptile things because I have so many, so much demand. And so we are building our community by building our size. Uh, and of course, with that, we want quality to go along with it. But uh, the way we've been doing it so far uh, has been critical to do that. So this, in no way do I ever want anybody to think that this, me going off and saying, okay, now I want to do a naturalistic breeding project is a criticism of the people who got us where we are today. Uh, but what my purpose is, is I'd like to be demonstrate a way that someone can have a side breeding project and not do it industrial, do it in a beautiful sort of way uh, with uh, each chameleon getting a large, well-planted cage, the females. Uh, it, it's so easy to get trapped into thinking, okay, I'm going to put three females in a small screen cage because they can survive and they'll produce eggs. And uh, that, that's what I've got them here for, right? Uh, and so that's that's the mindset of somebody who is in it to grow their business. Right. And what I would like to do is present an alternative mindset uh, that is limit the growth of your business to what you can handle. Um, chameleons need space. And so how much space do you have? limit your breeding to that space. And I am well aware that that will never be achieved by telling breeders to do it. Right. It will only be achieved when we tell the community that this is better for the chameleons and you can expect this. You can demand this. If you save your money for the people who are uh, showing their chameleons off in these beautiful cages and essentially treating them like valued pets instead of machinery uh, to be uh, used in a breeding operation. If you give your money to the breeders that are doing that, then that's the kind of breeding community that will arise from that demand. And so, uh, and, I, and I don't think that's hard. I think it's all, all we have to do is present to the customers that this does exist and that they can, uh, this is an option for them to, uh, to go for. Uh, and it, um, uh, there are breeders right now doing this. I mean, this, this is not a concept that I just came up with. There are little pockets of breeders uh, all the time. There are breeder, people doing this. And what I want to do is just bring it more into the limelight and say, not only 
uh, customers, does this exist? And it's a better way for the chameleons. Uh, and you can demand this, you can ask for it, and you will create that breeding community. I also want to present to the breeders, you don't have to think about this as a mass market thing. I want you to think about this as a beautiful thing. Uh, you have a beautiful setup in your room and you limit it. See, th this is a big concept that I hope to communicate is that limit limiting it means you, it'll probably continue because the, the biggest trap that chameleon people fall into is that uh, the, they have a clutch of uh, chameleons and they save 10 females from that clutch because the next time they're gonna, the, the next generation, they're gonna mate those 10 females and say they get 20 to 30 eggs from those 10 females. I should say 30 eggs because we're gonna feed them real well. That We're talking 300 eggs. Let's see, 300 times 300. Let's do some math here. And uh, uh, yeah, I can quit my job. I'm gonna raise chameleons yeah. for the rest of my life. Yeah. And the problem is that uh, it's no problem getting the females. It's no problem getting the eggs. That's the easy part. It's no problem incubating the eggs. The problem comes when those eggs hatch. And that is when we no longer hear from the breeders is because they essentially implode. Uh, they can't handle all those babies. The babies start biting each other and fighting because if you don't have those babies set up well, they start competing for resources. And they don't like being around each other deep inside of them. They are taught to fight. Uh, and so you'll get your first clutches. They'll, they'll absolutely be passive and you'll say, wow, this was so easy. And then you'll do those 10 females and you'll find out that uh, five of those clutches are uh, bloodthirsty animals wanting to kill each other. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden you're panicking because you don't have the space to separate them all. Uh, and, and it becomes an ugly thing because once they start biting each other, you can't sell them. And so what do you do? Um, and so there's a lot of flame outs because they just can't handle uh, the babies. So what I would like to do is I would like to present a, a rational way that somebody can do this, a responsible breeder. I'm going to take uh, probably uh, just breed two females. And I'm going to show the, uh, show the community how I can do a setup, a breeding setup that's naturalistic, healthy for the chameleons, treat them like pets, how the babies, if I, uh, if I time it right, and this is there's kind of tricks into timing it right, and I have only two clutches in the spring and two clutches in the fall, how that becomes a very manageable breeding project that can continue year after year after year, and maybe it can pay your mortgage. Right. As long as you have the self-discipline and strength to say, no, I'm not going to breed four females. I'm going to keep it at my two. Or if you've got the space for four, fine, four, but not six. And so it's, uh, I'm going to be uh, presenting this over two years. I'm going to be documenting this on my YouTube channel and podcast and in a section on my website. Uh, each step along the way as I build this breeding project and I'm going to show how I do it and, and, and share uh, when I do the sales. And at the end, uh, well, am I now paying my mortgage by it? Well, tune in and we'll both find out. Yeah, we will find out. Yeah, I, I love that. I, lo I love the fact that you're getting hands on with it and you're going to mm -hmm. you know, present this as an experiment you're doing yourself. So what are some of the challenges moving towards more of a naturalistic breeding setup? Like, I, I understand if you're a big breeder, obviously money is going to be the biggest thing, money in space. But is there other challenges, even with just working with a small number, that makes it a little bit more difficult? Uh, plants tend to die. You got to take care of... Uh, water plants. You got to take care of the environment. Mm -hmm. And the more complex the environment, uh, the, the more things you got to take care of. Uh when you're doing a breeding project, you have a certain amount of time to allot to it. If you have a, another job, well, okay, maybe you have a half hour, hour that you can dedicate to it because then you got that family that wants your attention. Uh, and so you can't be spending all your time doing this, or maybe you can, but there's still a limited an, uh, amount of time you have. And if you just have a bunch of plastic sprigs, in a screen cage, it's very easy to clean. It's very easy to take care of. You look at it, okay, it's okay. Uh, 
and you're looking at the female, it's sitting there and it's okay, you're done for the day. Everything's taken care of. If you have a big uh, uh, cage set up and you have uh, all these plants all over the place and uh, they're starting to die, oh, how do you figure out how to take care of the plants? Uh, it becomes more of a project. And okay, I, I am going to be putting a female chameleon into a two by two by four foot tall cage. Uh, you could, if I've got two females um, in those uh, kind of cages, I could actually do a rack with four females in that space. So uh, why not do that? Right. So this is, and then I get double the, uh, the income, right? And so these are, these are the temptations that come into it. So um, yeah, there are, I, I think the challenges are more within ourselves than it is physically actually pulling it off. Yeah. So it becomes sort of the similar challenges in quotes that are in the other species in the hobby where it, it can be done on a more of a naturalistic and complex setup, but really it becomes down to how much work we want to do. And that's what I love about, you know, TC's idea of doing the small batch or even micro batch. I would say two females is probably getting into the micro batch range. You are, you're not going to get overwhelmed with time. Like you're saying, if you have a bunch of mouths to feed it doesn't matter how simple the enclosures are. You're still worrying about all of those animals, but there's just so much more energy you can put into just two or three and you can really produce high quality animals. And like you said, it's instructing the buyer as well to ask for that. That's probably the, the biggest component is making sure people know that that's an option, but we have to present it that way first. Yeah. And, and this is why shows like yours, this is why I got so excited to see TC. And it's shows like yours and the things that I'm doing that are letting customers are the, the people know, the keepers know that this is a possibility. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I wanted to add the whole micro uh, idea. There's another component in that there is a whole lot more enjoyment out of a smaller uh, of a smaller group. The more you add on, the more work it is and the less enjoyment you have. Yeah. So this is a way that a breeder can enjoy, continue, uh, hold on to that joy that made them want to be a breeder in the first place. And this is the way that you'll stay a breeder for 10 years instead of flaming out after three. And this is this is very important to that my community that I'm talking about is uh, because we have so many people that start breeding projects they have a clutch or two and then they're done. This and so I am finding trying to find a way to uh, create the structure to where we're having more long term breeders stick with it. Uh, so making sure that the breeder the uh, breeder enjoys it is is part of that well and just imagine how much more knowledge we can extract from this this project if we have people who are sticking with it for 8 10 15 years it's just it, immense exactly it's the people who have been around for 10 years that have been doing it that have learned so much that we learned from and, and you can't just read that on the internet and then say, okay, now I'm a 10 year breeder. I have this experience. You've got to go through that 10 years before you really own that experience and are able to share it. Yeah. Yeah. You have yeah. to go to school. And, and you know, that, that's one of the things that I've talked about before on the show is humans, we have this almost, it's like a glitch in our brains where we're constantly wanting to buy things and wanting to, to continuously. And it, that's why reptiles can be so addicting and people have, yeah. you know, five, 10, 20, a hundred animals and the enjoyment comes in the purchase and you get that dopamine spike through the purchase and then it goes away and you have to go yeah. you replicate that over and over again. And I think a lot of people are out of control in the way where they don't realize it's that part of their brain that's doing the buying. It's not them. It's this, you know, part mm -hmm. this collector mindset that is probably something ancestral that we, we needed to survive. And that's what's operating on the reptile hobby. And it ends in the same way, the flame out, the I'm selling my entire collection. I'm out of money. I, I hate all of these animals. And if you can redirect that to just, even if it's not breeding, if it's just better care, that joy and fulfillment is is there and it's something you can actually stand on compared yeah. to just going to the store and getting another animal. Yes. And, and I guess say when you hatch out 
those chameleons, uh, you're going to get that dopamine spike. It, yeah, it's the most incredible feeling in the world to have those little dragons coming out of that egg and uh, and racing them up. So uh, don't worry if you're a breeder. Lot of a uh, lot of chameleons in your future. Yeah, yeah, you're going to have some excitement. So. I think we'll, we'll kind of start wrapping up. We've really okay. covered a lot here. Uh, I know that your wife also works with with some geckos yeah. as well. Can you just touch on on her projects as well? Yes, uh, my wife uh, is involved in breeding a Europlatus fantasticus, the satanic leaf-tailed gecko, and uh, it, it's an amazing thing. She's always been supportive of me with my chameleons, but it was always my thing, uh, and so imagine. And sometimes it stressed her out, and uh, we'd have to have those husband wife talks um where i said okay i won't get a whole new breeding group of quadricornas um <laughs> but then one one night she told me she needed to talk to me and uh she never quotes needs to talk to me so yeah you got my attention uh and then she said i really love the fantasticus i want to breed fantasticus and i okay uh, was she involved in the hobby at all at that point or just through? Yes. Oh, she was. Okay. Well, she was as a helper to me mm. and uh, she would always be helping. She would always, so she was working with the insects. She was working with the Fantasticus. I used to breed Fantasticus. Mm. Uh, I used to breed a lot of Fantasticus and she would be excited by them. And, and so she was there in the day-to-day -day maintenance of uh, reptiles. So this is nothing new to her, but it was new for her to all of a sudden it be hers uh, and, uh, boy, she, she jumped into it and she is, has become such an incredible breeder of Fantasticus. I mean, she knows each and every gecko in her collection and, uh, what they're doing. And boy, it's like a soap opera. She goes in there <laughs> and, and she's calling them by name and uh, just listening to it is entertaining. Uh, but, uh, she is in tune with each and every one of those geckos and she's doing just an incredible job. Yeah, that's so. That's awesome. It's it's great when someone can take responsibility for their own thing and they want to do something on their own. It must, be, it, especially as as your wife, it's nice to like have her part of the hobby in that way. Oh, it's it's amazing when we go out on dates looking for branches. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I just love doing that. And so it, we've it's been an incredible uh, experience to be able to have uh, my wife do this with me. And she's even claiming my Lichianus because it's a gecko. So now it's got to go in the gecko room. It's like, <laughs> can you believe this? <laughs> Send help. <laughs> so what else do you guys have? You have the, the geckos and you have obviously tons of chameleons. Is there anything else mm -hmm. in the collection? At this time, there isn't. I'm pretty much a, a, a focusing on the chameleons. Uh, I do have a, a lychee. And but there are dart frogs in our future because okay. uh, we used to have a lot of dart frogs, but in the last five years, because of work, the uh, other work, uh, I've been moving around uh, all around the state of California, and so it's been difficult to really get established. But uh, in a, actually, the move that I'm doing right now, going back to our the home that we own. And so uh, we'll be able to put down more roots than we have before. And dart frogs are part of that. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I would yeah. love to get dart frogs myself. Those are like you, I forget if it was in the podcast where we were mentioning before, but they, that's just one community that's just done so, so well with their, their husbandry and their care and their, they have these amazing enclosures. And so it's definitely something <laughs> that I'd love to tackle at some point. Yeah. And, and as I say, those of us who have live bearing chameleons, uh, dart frogs are great. So we continue our fruit fly cultures and we always have them available because we never know when we're going to be surprised by a bunch of babies. Right. So it's no extra work on your end to have them really yeah. after setting yeah. them up. Well, mm -hmm. Bill, thank you so much. I, I love this conversation. Can you let everybody know, obviously uh, most people will be aware of where they can find yeah. you, but can you let everybody know where they can find you and then as well as your wife's Instagram page too? Yeah. So I have consolidated every all of my outreaches under the Chameleon Academy. So there's a website, chameleonacademy.com, my YouTube channel, chameleon underscore academy, and uh, my Instagram, chameleon academy. Actually, I don't know where all the underscores are in all of those. Just look for the Chameleon Academy and you'll see you'll the, the, the Panther Chameleon in the rainbow colors. And that's me. And uh, in any podcast app, 
Uh, there's the Chameleon Academy podcast. And I even have a dedicated app for the podcast on uh, Apple and uh, Android. And so you can get an app that uh, allows you uh, access to all the, the episodes and uh, take take a chameleon research along driving in uh, your commute to work. Don't want to waste that time. Exactly. That's what I do. That's how I listen to your podcast. <laughs> and my wife uh, is under Misty Mountain Fans. Misty uh, Mountain you can Fans. Go- Misty Mountain Fance. You can find that on Instagram and mistymountainfance.com is the website where uh, we put all sorts of fantasticus information. Great. Is there anything else that we missed out today that you wanted to mention or do we pretty much hit everything that uh, we planned on chatting about? We hit everything that we planned on chatting about, but I will say from a guy who's been around for many years, decades and has seen this community grow over those many decades. Uh, This is a very exciting time. And we are entering into an era where that enrichment of the reptiles, the naturalistic keeping of them is becoming mainstream. And that's an exciting wave to ride right now. There's always been naturalistic keeping. There's always been people worried about uh, enrichment, but now it's starting to become mainstream. And that's when you start getting that critical mass to where the overall community embraces it. And uh, I'm excited to be able to watch that and be part of that. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't have said that better myself. I, you can feel that swell coming up into into all of sort of permeating herpetoculture. And I, I think I completely agree. It's very exciting. And, and for yourself, I can't think of one person who's done more for a section of the hobby as far as pushing it forward that way. It's just your name is associated with chameleons by across the world, I assume. So I think I can speak for all of the listeners and myself. Thank you for all of the work that you do. We know that the tremendous hours you must put in to produce all of this excellent content. So we do really appreciate that. And thank you for joining me on the show. This was a blast. I, I'm so glad to have been here. Thank you for having me on and see you all guys on the interwebs. That is the end of the episode. Bill, thank you so much for joining me today. I do really appreciate it, but I think I can speak for everybody within Herpetoculture and say how much we appreciate the work that you do pushing the chameleon hobby in the right direction. And like I said through the intro, so many of us listen to your podcast that don't even keep chameleons because the information is such high quality and it can be translated so easy to other species. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Listeners, if you enjoyed the episode, thank you so much for listening. If you want to share it on social media, I do always appreciate that. One way you can show your support for the show is just simply going to the Apple Podcasting app and giving the show a five-star rating. That does really help improve our visibility within the Apple Podcasting app. And if you listen to that podcast, just think about how much work Bill has done in the domain of chameleon keeping and how how much information there is to be had. And, you know, he's talked about having over 200 episodes and spending years and years coming up with these different care sheets and care guides and whatnot. If you are somebody that's been working with a species for that long, I think we need more people like Bill Strand working with different species. So Bill really has chameleons covered. I don't think anybody needs to go into that domain. But there are, as you know, thousands or hundreds of different species that we keep in captivity. It would be amazing if we could have different people like Bill tackling different species. Just imagine how good that would be for herpetoculture in general, how good that would be for people coming into it, but also people looking from the outside saying, are these guys ethically treating these animals properly? Do they really know what they're doing? Do they deserve to own specialty animals like reptiles? You know, you could put Bill up on a pedestal and say, this is an example of why we do deserve to do this. And I think if we can replicate that model in several different species, that would be amazing. So if you're somebody that's been working with a species and you think that maybe now's the time to do it, I encourage you to do it. However you want to do it, maybe it's through Instagram or Facebook, or maybe you want to start a podcast or start a YouTube channel. There's many different avenues to do this, but I think what Bill's doing is incredible. And the more we could replicate that model, the better. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for any new amazing enclosures, they really do have some of the best enclosures on the market as well as the most customizable enclosures on the market. So definitely go check them out. Link is in the description that is an affiliate link. So if you do make a purchase, a commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you, which of course helps me produce the show. And if you are interested in joining us on Patreon, go to patreon.com slash animals at home. There you can sign up. You'll have access to early access to the episodes as well as access to ask questions to the upcoming guests. 
I think that's it. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast this week, and I will catch you guys next weekend.